Ken's kind of running the show. Ken Carson's his name. Yeah, um, yeah. Bill.
Test, test. Works. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if everybody can have a seat there. Good turn. What's that? Good turn. I like that. That is, yeah. That's that's the um, original axe. There was uh, copies made for. Uh, they were used on Denali on the uh, Centennial climb. Wow. Yeah. Let me let me just um, this ice axe here. By the way, I'm Roger Robinson. But just before Ken, uh, this is Ken Carson that's been helping load people. Um, people's PowerPoints today, but Ken is the great-grandson of Harry Carson's, who was on the first ascent of Denali, and they made can remember, axes of, the, uh, that, of that climb, and this particular axe, that, that went up the mountain, didn't it, this year, that Dana Wright took. Uh, uh, um, he is a, uh, gosh, great nephew of, of Walter Harper, so, um, but anyway, that axe made it to the top of Denali, which is pretty cool, because that thing is about this tall, it's about four feet tall, so pretty amazing. It's like a fence post. But uh, I'll let Ellen kick off here and I'll bring in a couple, we just have a couple announcements before we start the program. Okay, welcome. I'm Ellen Lapham and Roger and I are the co-chairs of this conference. Come on, you guys sit, yeah. stand there. Uh, this follows on our successful 2010 conference, also hosted by the American Alpine Club called Exit Strategies where we spent three full days dealing with human waste. We're only going to extend one day on it because actually this year I think you'll hear some wonderful ideas that represent significant progress in dealing with it, along with two other days of programming that deals with planning and access and sort of a, a set of things that anything having to do with energy management to uh, waste removal in Antarctica uh, that really are useful not just in those extreme environments but also we think globally. A couple of announcements. We are really fortunate this year to have media interns who are going to be interviewing various people who, whom some of you have already met. Christina Renas and uh, Brad Rassler. Would you mind standing just so people know who you are? And they're going to be doing active interviewing, tweeting, Facebook posting, and other things. And one thing we would really like to encourage everyone here to do is on the back wall, there are two uh, small posters that give you the information you need to put on your Twitter feed or your Facebook pages, uh, links to the conference URL, or you could repost Twitter feeds to your Twitter universe. In addition, and I want to thank Denali National Park especially for this capability, this entire conference is being live streamed over the internet in real time uh, through a company called Livestream, but more importantly Denali National Park has been terrific in saying that this is a pioneering technology that we need to be using frequently, and this conference I think is the first big instance of its use, uh, at least certainly within the Park Service universe. So thank you Denali National Park and Leon, who is our expert on um, working with the technology. So uh, the Just, URL no. for the live stream is also posted on the back. So if you wanted to send out emails tonight to your colleagues and say if you're not here and you want to watch sessions live, uh, you can go to that live. address and get, the, uh, and, and get the live feed. It'll also, by the way, be stored after the fact. But again, this is one way that we think that all the people in this room who are so important to sustainable summits can actually leverage your attendance here and share it uh, with uh, colleagues. All right, thank you, Ellen. Um, a few other things. Um, we are, uh, those that are staying at the Colorado School of Mines, breakfast will be avail uh, available at 7.15 tomorrow morning to about 8.30. Um, we will be starting tomorrow at nine in the morning. Uh, we do, we'll continue the registration. Um, we'll be in, the doors will be open uh, by eight tomorrow if you, if you come down then. But um, great time to visit with, we have a wonderful uh, international uh, crew of people here representing some major, major areas around the world. So it's, it's pretty neat once you get to meet everybody that's here. And Peter up front here, uh, Peter Metcalf is going to be our keynoter in the morning. Um, it was a, uh, a great talk that he's put together. 
But um, we do have, uh, for those that are here, we have water bottles that we'll be giving out tomorrow. We'll have a, a program that we're giving out in the morning. And if you have your coffee mug, you can get a Denali pin of the park, a really cool pin. Um, if you don't have a mug, we, uh, the AEC can, uh, supposedly has some to sell. We'll have to get those out here. Um, but, um, and we also have Raider paper cups, but you won't get a Denali pin if you have a paper cup. So um, <laughs> we have those paper cups here. So. Um, Mention the food and coffee. Oh, yes. And we do, we do have um, snack foods um, that will be there for breakfast, just a little teeny bit. I think, what is it, oranges and, and bananas. And um, we have lots of coffee in the morning, or as much as we can make. Um, we have a 100-cup pot, pot that Pam back here is doing all the food for us. Um, my wife um, will be uh, working all day tomorrow for the next three days doing this food stuff. Um, and what else do we have on that list? Uh, it, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, if you got any questions, just grab us. Um, we're going to pretty much run from Ken Carson's tonight, uh, actually with uh, Jim McCarthy opening up here, right up front here, then Ken Carson's, and then uh, with Conrad Anchor. And um, I think we're ready to roll here. Yeah, so. let me just do a quick intro of Jim. Yeah. Uh, Jim McCarthy's going to give us a welcome. Uh, he, some of you know him as a uh, climber who pioneered a lot of routes in the gunks or went up into northern Canada and attempted some serious stuff. Uh, he's also now the past president of the AAC and also its current honorary president. So I want to thank Jim for being here and welcoming us. Jim? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, in addition to my present title as Honorary President of the American Alpine Club, I also have the honor of being the Honorary Vice President of the UIAA, which is the International Organization of Climbing uh, Organizations with 88 organizations worldwide. And they basically represent the entire worldwide climbing community. The American Alpine Club, Denali National Park, and the UIAA and the American Alpine Club are very pleased to welcome the delegates here. Uh, I don't think there's ever been such a convocation of mountain experts, and this is what we need. We need to share the knowledge of you experts to preserve our precious mountains. And with that, on behalf of the American Alpine Club and the worldwide climbing community, I welcome you. introducing Ken Karstens. Ken, you're the grandson, great-grandson, great -grandson, skipped a generation of, of one of the first people to summit Denali. And I'm not going to take any of his thunder away. I just want you all to give him a terrific welcome. We are so pleased he's here. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, excuse me for a second. Yeah. Do you have a remote mic on you? Oh, yeah, see, you were supposed to yell. 
go over to until they turn it on. Well, we've been working on it. All right, this is a good button. Starting to talk. Is it good? All right. All right, Wickersham Wall wasn't climbed until 1963 by a team from Harvard. That's a, that's a long time to figure out how to climb it. Everybody that's looked at this thing in the early days couldn't figure out a way up. These are the guys that finally made it. Uh, Wickersham found gold in the, uh, in the area when he, uh, when he couldn't figure out a way to climb the mountain. He went prospecting. This, uh, this gold sort of started a small, uh, small rush and Harry and, uh, and his partner, Charles McGonagall, decided to mine the miners, the only way you can make money during a gold rush. They started a freight service to bring goods into the Cantitiona. The Cantitiona is the area at the end of the National Park Road, um, uh, right behind Denali, a little bit north. Uh, the only civilization around the mountain for just forever. Uh, McGonagall we'll hear about in a little bit. Harry. Uh, it did go on to become the superintendent of the park, first superintendent and the first uh, climbing leader of the uh, first summit, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is the way that, uh, that Cook came in, in 1903. Frederick Cook, uh, North Pole uh, explorer. He, uh, his first attempt, he made several. Uh, his first one came in from Cook Inlet, way down by Anchorage, and he circumnavigated the mountain. Couldn't quite find a way in. He came up with the same spot just almost a month later, uh, after Wickersham, 1903. Came in and he, uh, he tried the Peters Glacier, saw the same wall, uh, declared like everybody else did until the 60s that it's unclimbable. He then left, first real circumnavigation of the mountain uh, recorded. Uh, if, if he had stopped here, we'd remember him favorably. Uh, oh, that's not helpful. There he is, 1903, right before the uh, right before the start of his climb. <sighs> right, this thing's going to be a nuisance. Uh, in uh, 1906, 1910, and 1912, Belmore Brown made three stabs at it. First one was uh, was an honest uh, attempt at the climb. Uh, the yellow here uh, went up and tried to get in from the south with Dr. Cook on his second expedition. Cook sent. Uh, he sent everybody home, they, uh, they gave up, and then he uh, went back and tried it again, and claimed the summit. Uh, Bradford Washburn, there's a museum in the building named after him. He's, uh, well, you should all know who Brad Washburn is. Uh, spent his life working on this book, just proving Cook's claim. Uh, working with the, uh, oop, nah, we're not ready for that yet. Working with uh, the work of Belmore Brown and uh, his partner, uh, Parker, they, uh, the next series of expeditions up the mountain ended up uh, working to disprove Cook's claim of a summit. And uh, let's see, uh, about the same time, 1906, Charles Sheldon, he uh, came in, uh, he is an explorer. He is the father of Denali National Park. He is the guy uh, that created the park. He's the one that took it into the president's office and had it signed bulldoze a thing right through from the very beginning. This is his toe clock cabin from a few years later. His, uh, his packer on this uh, was Harry Karstens. And while they were out there hunting doll sheep and exploring, uh, learning about the area, they kept bumping into the old timers and running all over the mountain. They, uh, they sort of discovered the, uh, the easiest approach onto the mountain through McGonagall Pass. Uh, there, there's a lot of history here. I only have 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, long and the short of it is, Sheldon talking with the local, the local miners, they were all able to get together and come to a consensus on the easiest way up. Uh, 1910, uh, we have Mosimus, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, expedition. They went in to prove that Cook did it. And they came back, well, they came back <laughs> disbelievers. Um, Parker Brown, uh, Brown really worked to find the, folk, the, uh, the peak photo, recreate it. Uh, this is the photo that he took and Cook's original photo on the far side there. Uh, and it, it is two major expeditions to, this one was to disprove, the last one was to prove. They both came away convinced there was no way Cook could have made it. 
1910, we had, uh, we had another climb, Charlie McGonigal. Uh, Anderson, Lloyd, the big guy sitting down there, and uh, Billy Taylor. These guys are known as the Sourdoughs or the Glen Creek Boys. They basically ran up this mountain. They had flapjacks in their pocket, pancakes, and hot cocoa. It's, it's a legend uh, that's mostly true. Uh, these guys, just animals. They went right up the mountain. Yes, Charlie, that is the man you're named after. <laughs> so the picture's hanging on his wall in his room. All right. Tom Lloyd comes back, and uh, he comes into Fairbanks. He's the only guy that comes back to civilization after their climb. They made it to the North Peak. They raised a 14-foot spruce pole that they, uh, they hauled up this thing. They, they dragged a tree up a mountain. They, uh, they put that thing up on the peak that could be seen from Fairbanks. And Tom Lloyd comes back to civilization. He, he exaggerates, tells a, tells a tale. And uh, he, is, he is branded worse than Cook. He, he is caught in a lie. When the other guys come back into town, things start developing. So McGonagall goes back, uh, goes back to work. Lloyd goes back to work. The other two, Anderson and, Lloyd, and um, and Taylor, they go back up. They make it to just shy, pretty much Denali Pass, a little bit short of that. They walk back up in just a couple of days, ran it, and to take pictures. It's pretty much the, uh, they don't exist. They were destroyed years and years ago. Nobody's seen them forever. But these guys climbed the mountain twice in 1910 with primitive, primitive gear. Uh, let's see, Parker Brown's 12 expedition, uh, same thing, a little out of order. Right about this time, uh, Harry is going outside. He's going back to Chicago to visit his family for the first time in a lot of years. Uh, he's visiting his friend Charles Sheldon again. Sheldon has gotten married and has had some kids. And when Harry's there visiting, he says, I can't climb this mountain anymore. I'm married and I have kids. And uh, it's about that time that when Harry gets back in, uh, Hudson Stuck is waiting for him. Uh, on the trail, and Harry walks most of the way back to Fairbanks, it's 200 and some odd miles, and uh, Stuck catches him on the trail and gets him, finally, convinces him to climb the mountain. So we have, we have a year of buildup. Uh, Harry is uh, caching supplies. Uh, this is the map that uh, Stuck uh, made here. They, they, a year early, at the fall, they, they take a river boat and they dump everything in as close as they can from Fairbanks. Uh, they wait for the snow to fall and they start, uh, they start their adventure. Ah, really? Leaving Fairbanks. A couple teams of dogs. Uh, they pick up another team in uh, Ninana, about halfway down, and they pick up the rest of the team. Uh, well, this is going to be a blast. Okay, just a bunch of... Uh, Scenery shots here. Uh, we're getting in um, Cache Creek. Uh, we're, I had a three day walk up this. It was from the end of the park road all the way up to these hills. It took us almost three days through mud and horrible, horrible things. Nobody took a single picture. We were so miserable. Mosquitoes and everything. So here's our, uh, our base camp. There are more pictures of this than uh, you can shake a stick at. Um, I've been spending the last 10, 15 years collecting these old photos. They're scattered everywhere. Uh, Hudson Stuck ordered all of, his, uh, all of his papers burned at his death, and all the original photos were burned. Everything we have left are things that were loaned out to friends, uh, published, or they were just tucked into a book somewhere and forgotten about. Um, so we have, our, we have our team, everybody here but uh, Dr. Stuck. Uh, he is, sorry, this stuck, obviously. Uh, Tatum, he's a, uh, he's a young kid, about 21, from Knoxville, Tennessee. Esaias George, Harry. Johnny Fredson, Johnny stayed behind and he kept camp. That was his whole job, to uh, make sure base camp was, was safe. Um, and Walter Harper, Walter Harper is a half-breed uh, Athabascan. His father was uh, one of the fathers of the Klondike, a very famous man, and his very famous son. Uh, let's see, a newly rediscovered photo of, uh, of Tatum and Harry 
at, uh, at the camp. This one has been lost until just a year or so ago. These are my guys uh, sitting at that McKinley bar. Let's see. That is really. All right, 1913, uh, kind of a unique attempt. We, uh, we killed a lot of animals near base camp. Uh, it was a two, uh, two caribou and a, uh, and a sheep, and then a caribou a little bit later on. We made uh, pemmican which is basically uh, meat, fat, rice, and uh, some other things just thrown in there, uh, fruits and whatever else dried. Uh, you would uh, heat it up uh, with uh, Ebswurst, a German um, army food staple. It's pea soup with a little bit of bacon added into it, and it's, a, uh, it's basically a biscuit like a, uh, like a beef bouillon cube. You drop it into water with that pemmican ball, and it's a soup. They use that for high altitude. Uh, Belmore Brown had been chased off the mountain by bad food. His cans of pemmican exploded. They went bad, and uh, that and the storm chased him off. Uh, we're up to McGonagall Pass here. This is how it looks now. Uh, this is one of very few ways to get to the range right now. You've got, in the distance there, Gunsight Pass, that really low spot up on the glacier. Uh, it is tricky to do, but it can be done. Uh, how it looked in 1913. Just as, this is a little bit around the corner here. This is near their first camp, how that spot looks today. Let's see if I can make this thing work. Yeah. It's, uh, it's changed a little bit. Glacier has dropped quite a bit. Uh, you can no longer take a dog over McGonagall Pass. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's some 90 feet down, and it's, well, it's nasty. It's about an hour trip now just to go a couple hundred yards. Uh, those of you roped up, this is how we did it back then. Uh, just a rope around the waist and just hope. Uh, we actually took the time to build bridges over crevasses. They, uh, they tried to go around them occasionally, but uh, they usually just built a nice big bridge. They had to run a dog sled up this, uh, up this glacier. This is my new pride and joy. Uh, this is a glass lantern slide that has not seen the light of day since about 1914. I just found this thing on eBay of all places, misidentified, and uh, I spent a little bit of time with some experts. Uh, we, uh, we compared everything, headwear, uh, snowshoes, packs, and the early poles before they were lost in crevasses. Uh, we're just below Gunsight Pass here, and uh, well, very proud. This is. Uh, Again, has not been seen in the light of day for almost 100 years. Um, dogs all the way up to 10,000 feet. Oop. All right. The, uh, up on top there, you have the Harper Icefall. Uh, we're at 10,800 feet. And uh, this is how it looked in uh, 1913 and how it looked in 2013. Uh, it hasn't changed. It's the same chunk of ice falling over and over and over again. Uh, in 1912, Belmore Brown was chased off the mountain by a giant earthquake. As he hit his base camp, the mountain exploded. Uh, chunks of ice the size of houses uh, just everywhere. The whole thing was destroyed. He walked up this thing in three days. Uh, Harry and Walter Harper spent over three weeks navigating this little one mile stretch of snow and ice here. They had to push house sized blocks of ice over the edge. It's 4,000 feet straight down on the other side, just shy of 2,000 on this side once you get up there a little ways. Uh, right here, it's only a couple hundred feet. Um, again, this, every other climb before this, they walked up this if they made it this far quickly. It was an easy, easy bit of work, almost a month. Uh, today, it's a brown tower up there. That's a nice little landmark for you. This was, uh, I, I had forgotten about this picture when I was, um, when I was climbing. I came back and reread uh, Hudson Suck's book. And when we first crested Karsten's Ridge, this is the view we got, we looked over at. This is, uh, we didn't, nobody took a picture because again, we had, it was a horrible day. <laughs> uh, this is the only day of bad weather we had. The clouds were, uh, were packed in. We did not see this view until the second or third day. We just went up this ridge blindly. 
and it was really great to see that Stuck had the same thing. When they first peeked over, it was all cast over. Uh, three weeks later, we get the camp on the first flat spot up this ridge. We're getting into the coxcomb leading to uh, Brown Tower. And uh, we camped a little bit short of this. We, uh, we had the National Park Service about a week ahead of us, and they made some really nice campsites along the way. And we just we used every one we could. It was really nice of them. <laughs> uh, again, the, uh, the other team that climbed this year, uh, National Park Service, uh, my guys, and a Knowles group. Knowles parked in the, uh, in the same spot that Harriet parked in, right there. We were a little jealous. <clears throat> three miles, oh hey, look at that, they say it's three miles, neat. Again, it's just, it's a ridge walk now and they're, they're making this up as they go along. None of these guys had any mountaineer ex experience except for Stuck. He had just uh, played around in the Alps and a little bit in, uh, on Rainier. This is on the descent, but it's the same, uh, the same area. Was, uh, we accidentally ended up with this shot, too. Um, you see a snow level up there on the, uh, it's, that's 100, 300 feet, whatever. I would love to get out there and measure that sometime, but this, this glacier has dropped quite a bit. Carson's Ridge used to be pretty easy to access uh, via the notch right there at the bottom, and uh, now it's quite a tall climb. Fifteen. We uh, we did most of this in a big push. Uh, we had one more camp after the uh, after the pass. This is they're a little bit lower down than we were up on the top of these big rocks here. They were right below us, and they do a camp every five hundred feet for the next little while. Uh, it was uh, it was a nice walk for us. It must have still been uh, pretty bad for the glacier, but they were every every five hundred feet. And uh, 16, 5, 17. And then they suddenly had a 3,000 foot push up to just below the summit. This is not actually 20,000, this is closer to 19. This is in the pass, uh, North Summit, I believe. Roger, is that? That is a North Summit, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Cl close enough? <laughs> Alrighty. So, yeah, this is just, this is leading up into Denali Pass then. These crampons are, are basically sheet steel. Uh, it's, it's, it's an old uh, oil can that they, uh, they just basically tied together. It's uh, metal straps, some sinew, and these spikes, if you step on a rock, they just fold up. They're not that substantial. They're actually, now, they're very likely the ones that are sitting in, a, uh, in the display at the Park Service. Uh, Harry did say in his diary that he borrowed Charlie McGonigal's uh, crampons, his uh, creepers, um, right before they started. And the creepers that are in the museum at Denali National Park are identified as Charles McGonigal's. And they were found by Grant Pearson in 32-ish um, on the glacier. Or, Roger, do you know the exact spot where they were found? I've, no, I've, I've never asked. They're somewhere, somewhere down there in the rocks. It's, uh, all right, uh, summit day. They went up a slightly different route than we do today. We, uh, when you're climbing up the Muldrow, you sort of still wrap around uh, to Denali Pass and up the uh, Zebra Rocks, which are just kind of right around the corner there. They went straight shot. Oh, really? At the summit, uh, Tatum put up a little tent, which didn't last very long, and uh, now, the, the camera was completely frozen. Harry's hands were, uh, were, he couldn't move his fingers after three or four seconds having his gloves off. It was so cold. Um, all, the, all the summit pictures are terrible, truly terrible. But here, we're taking the uh, boiling, te uh, boiling point thermometers. Uh, we're doing elevation checks right now. Uh, all this equipment, there are three pieces of, uh, of equipment they hauled up the top here. And, uh, and Tatum sat there for almost an hour, figuring out the elevation and, uh, and all those funny little things they had to do back then. We can do with a wristwatch now. Summit photo number one. Uh, 
clicked the trigger four times, didn't know he was doing it. Uh, Tatum's flag, he, uh, he had to hand make this flag. This is from a 1932 newspaper, which I'll show you in a second here. Uh, they forgot to pack a flag, and they, uh, after, their, after the fire that almost devastated their, uh, their climb, almost turned them around, uh, he grabbed scraps of fabric and started sewing so they'd have a flag. Today, the family still has it hanging on their wall in Tennessee. It's, uh, it's an ugly little thing. <laughs> hmm. Uh, Dana really did climb that, or uh, climb this mountain with that, that five-pound monstrosity, cursing it every every day. Johnny Fred, he uh, he kept that camp, like I said earlier. Uh, he wouldn't touch the sugar. It, it, there's an entire chapter in Stuck's book dedicated to this boy. He um, Stuck was so touched when he got back that that he didn't touch the sugar. Uh, the uh, climbers had lost all their sugar in the fire, and they had, hadn't had any for weeks. Uh, pretty big thing. He was still sitting there when he got back. He was able to have sugar. Uh, John Fred went on to be the greatest leader of the Gwich'in people, uh, <coughs> northern uh, Alaska, south of the Eskimos, north of Fairbanks. And uh, there are still people today, three, four generations later, that uh, idolize this man and live their life by his example. Uh, Great leader. Just uh, you listen to any native uh, in that village talk about him. Series of villages, I should say. Uh, they still talk about him like he's alive. Uh, Stuck's book. Stuck died in 1920. Um, he left behind five books, and the woman that had the orders to burn his papers did not burn his diaries. She decided they were too important to history, and she hid them in a church. And they were discovered in 1988, give or take a little bit. Um, and a guy was able to write a, an amazing biography uh, about Stuck. He uh, led an amazing life. He did wonderful things for Alaska. Uh, again, he's remembered in that same village uh, like he is still alive. He, he, uh, he pulled those people out of the Stone Age. Uh, Robert Tatum, he uh, sort of went, for the rest of his life, he sort of went back and forth from, uh, from Alaska back to Tennessee at home. He ended up traveling the country as an Episcopal missionary uh, all over. He came back to Alaska uh, as his first real station. In 1932, um, when Grant Pearson and his guys went back up onto the mountain for the first time since the first successful ascent in 1913, Tatum was, uh, was still alive. And some of these pictures are not in Stuck's book. They're not published anywhere else. They're only in this newspaper. I still don't know where they are. These are the only copies that, uh, that are known right now. I've gone through every source I can think of. They just don't exist anymore. The, uh, the guy that wrote this article was also the guy that uh, wrote the Scopes Monkey Trial uh, articles, a uh, very famous reporter. Harry went on to become superintendent of Denali National Park. Uh, he started building the road. He put in the first cabins. He uh, explained the locals the way it was going to be, and they believed him. His reputation was quite, uh, I don't know, eccentric. Uh, what you see today is very similar to how he left it uh, in 1928. That is Charles McGonigal and Harry Karstens. Uh, they went their separate ways after the mail service, but one of the main reasons Harry climbed that mountain was to vindicate his friend, Charlie McGonigal, lifelong partner. They had they'd almost died in the uh, snow delivering mail a hundred times over a couple year period. They were, they were partners uh, delivering the US mail by dog sled through virgin land, places where people just had never been. They ended up living next door to each other uh, more than 50 years later for years. Best of friends. Uh, new biography that just came out about Harry. We finally gave up uh, our giant collection of stuff. Uh, we've been keeping most of our papers in the family a secret. We finally let somebody in to, uh, to run through it for this anniversary. <sighs> Merle Lavoie was the uh, photographer for, um, uh, for the 1912 expedition. And this photo, I just found this on a uh, National Park website, uh, NPS. 
uh, Lavoie was not around for Archdeacon Stuck's uh, climb. I always entertained by these little things. Alrighty. And no, I didn't wrap that up very well. All right, who's next, Conrad? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ken. You can you can see that um, people get. Uh, I was going to use a word like obsessive about Denali, but uh, it's obvious that your obsession has really helped us understand a lot about the history of the mountain and some of the uh, characters who chose to climb it. We just want to make sure Conrad's uh, computer is properly set up, and then I'll do a short intro. All set? Yeah, I'm gonna grab the microphone. Well, while he's grabbing the microphone, I'll do a quick introduction. I don't think Conrad Anchor needs an introduction, but succinctly, uh, he's a climber who has climbed on his principles. He's been a strong advocate for uh, the environment in multiple places, not just in mountain regions. And uh, He's the uh, stepdad of some wonderful kids. And we've asked him to be here because he made a very interesting uh, uh, foray up to Nali recently, and we thought you'd enjoy hearing about it. All right. We, You're on. Is this recording? You guys picking it up? So I'm not going to do Everest, which is a slideshow I can do in my sleep day in and day out. They were moving expeditiously as if to make up for lost time. So this is a new show. So it's all something new, and I don't have my usual speaking mode where I have the upcoming slide. So if I miss something on there, you guys will bear with me. But this is my grandmother and grandfather, and um, our family's from Central California, Tuolumne County. And um, the, um, my grandmother, her side of the family, the, the Corcoran side, they came there in 1853. And, ran the Miwoks off and started selling beans and provisions to miners and everything, and then um, carved the road up through uh, Tenaya Pass and the tree that goes through there. So it's kind of like where my family is, and that was sort of my starting point of where i um, getting out there. That's my dad and my mom, and my dad always said, if I picked up a cow every day, I would get strong. And we always wondered, we were like, well, when can you not pick up the cow? Because the cow is going to be getting heavier a little bit each day, but not all that time. So that was always uh, the good time. But this was um, what our family did. Um, this is, uh, my dad liked lining us up as, as organ pipes. This is uh, Dana Peak, which is a high point of Tuolumne County. And so I'm the kid with the jug, hair, jug ears and whatnot. Um, and I think my dad took this snapshot. He was like, oh, the new color cameras. And then he didn't get it processed until October, because this was definitely in the summer. It wasn't in October and in, in up there in the high country. But um, this is how I got started. We would go out every uh, summer for two weeks with burrows, and it was always a great adven adventure. And so, the, um, of course, the burrows would run away, or we'd try to ride them, or we'd do great things with them. But it was, um, it was what we did. Not, we didn't go to uh, the beach, or we didn't go motorboating, and we didn't go to Disneyland. It was, and so it was always looked forward to these, these moments out in the backcountry with um, the family. It, I think uh, at this one time, there was a rescue there. I don't know what was more amazing, a, a lady in a tank top or a helicopter, but <laughs> I'm getting older there. 
so there was all these things we'd see in the backcountry there. But um, by the time I uh, figured out what I wanted to do in life, it was pretty simple. I wanted to climb, and so I moved to uh, Salt Lake City. I attended the University of Utah, and um, it was a great location. I, I, um, lots of climbing. It was a really vibrant community there in the early 1980s, and I was fortunate to to have a mentor to come in there and um, sort of help show me the ropes and get me going on things. This is uh, Mug Stump, and about uh, 12 years older than I am, and um, he was a great guy. He sort of took me under his wing and uh, showed me the, the ropes of uh, what climbing was about, and um, I know Roger and a lot of the folks here in the audience had, had worked with Muggs when he was up on Denali, and um, unfortunately, Muggs perished in a um, crevasse fall on the south buttress of Denali, and this was um, the last picture that he and I had together uh, with a rented uh, Cadillac. And double 88 is a lucky number, and ESP, so it's like UFOs and everything, but anyways. <laughs> he was a great guy, and he, um, he was my main introduction to Alaska, because he was like, well, if you want to go climb Alaska, you have to do all these things. If you want to climb in the Himalayas, you have to do Denali. If you want to climb a technical route, you have to do um, El Cap. So I worked at Denali Base Camp um, with Annie. This was um, before the breakup of the... Um, the the Soviet Union and the fall of the Iron Curtain, and there was a Polish team that showed up. These guys were great. And so they came over with a lot of down jackets to sell and trade, and they wanted to trade MSRs. So I was the broker, and I was just like, okay, great. And these guys were like, oh, I want a Polish down jacket, and these, these guys wanted MSR stoves. And, but he was sort of like the guy at base camp. He tended base camp, and um, he had this wonderful button of of Pope John Paul on his chest, and he and I would hang out. So he was like the senior guy on their trip, and he had flown him over there. Yeah, life was bad. <laughs> this is Gordy Quito. This is what it was like. It's quite a mess there. <laughs> we did clean up. That was it, like your typical. <laughs> Jenny's laughing at my beard. <laughs> I know, that's why I shave every day, dear. And so there was the beard. This was um, the northwest face of Mount Hunter, and. Um, Climbed that with my buddy Seth, and of course we went up on it, and we got hit by this huge storm, and we're like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to go down, so we have to eat all our food now. Of course, it cleared the next morning. <laughs> but um, it's interesting, that route came back in 2014, 2013 to take a look at it, and it was uh, really quite a bit different. But um, some of the best adventures I had were when you take away the access that we normally have. So this was skiing into the... Kachatnas from Rainy Pass, pre-breakup in 1990. That was another fun expedition. And about that time, in the 1990s, uh, Alex and Jenny moved up from uh, Ventura. They were working there with uh, Peter and the fine people at Chenard. It became Black Diamond. And Alex and I became fast friends and good partners. I had more hair then. We were wearing groovy vests. <laughs> but we, it was fun. We had a great uh, dynamic partnership. Um, we were both the same size, the same level of motivation, same size foot, so we could take one pair of climbing shoes and all these fun things that we sort of planned around when we were up on the mountain, which was, and then trained, flexing our, the, the ski poles that we had there. But Alex was more than um, strictly a climber. I mean, that was what many of us know about, but um, he was always, uh, what always impressed me was his dedication as a family man, and he always referred to Jenny as a saint because she was there. And this is uh, out winter camping with, uh, Max, who's now um, 26, and there's a, a great little picture there. And of course, um, we brought them all in there, and they really uh, started enjoying. So here's Max enjoying snowflakes and pulling his uh, younger brother Sam. And the <laughs> Sam's already getting his toughness training going, so he, he really liked that. So they're uh, so that was kind of the thing. But it was interesting. The boys kind of grew up around climbing. This is what. Uh, Max is like, he's probably like four, and Sam's, or no, Max is probably six, Sam's probably two or three in that picture, and another neighbor kid there playing around, hanging in a portal ledge, making faces at each other, so. But it's a, diff a difficult thing, you know, to, to kind of grow up in this family with climbing, especially for Max, who's the oldest, Sam and Isaac, with a, a father as legend as Alex, and then turn of events, unfortunately, in 1999, on Shishapangma, an avalanche came down and swept uh, Alex and Dave Bridges to their death, and leaving them without um, anyone there. And it was a real 
it was a really tough time. This was uh, Jenny and Alex. They had, um, this was the last summer they were together before we departed off to uh, Shisha Pangma. And Alex and uh, Max on the right climbed the Grand Teton together. It was a big thing for them, and they really uh, looked forward to it. It was, um, it was a tough time for all of us. I, um, 99 was a, a brutal year. It, I started out um, with a two-week invitation, went to Everest, found Mallory. That went into the press, kind of in a one-side thing. Five months later, I went to Tibet. My best friend dies in an avalanche. So I had to kind of pick up the pieces there. And uh, Jenny super helped me out. And um, we grew to be fast friends and fell in love. And so here we are in the summit of Half Dome. So there's, um, we're like, OK, if we're going to make this work, we've got to give the kids a litmus test and have them go up the cable route on Half Dome. And we um, ended up getting married in Italy, the boys young. and. Um, at that, you can see as they grow in the pictures of our slideshow here, as they get older and older. And it was, um, you know, we uh, try to have as normal a family as possible. It, it's um, both dads being professional climbers, and my work still involves a fair amount of risk going out and being in the mountains. But we still enjoy the fun things in life, like birthday parties, goofing off with each other. Here's Max. I think he's probably like 15 or 16, our neighborhood friends. My birthday, we always have fun birthday parties. So I think it's because I on the cake. <laughs> Max is looking serious. But um, there are always um, good things. And in between all of that, I would, um, in 2007, I went to Everest to film a uh, bio documentary about the um, explorer George Mallory, where we climbed as much as we could in period clothing and then kind of went after it in a different way. Um, it's a, a neat thing. but. It was sort of interesting. It was like, oh, what does your dad do when kids are at, at school? And they're like, well, my dad's the city planner, or my dad works at Murdoch's Ranch and Supply, or my dad climbs mountains. And it's a pretty crazy thing. So we're always trying to find that, that balance there. So, um, but um, Jenny, with uh, the, the grace and patience she had for Alex, she transferred it over to me. And I'm always thankful and grateful for that. And, um, you know, we enjoy this. We enjoy the Alpine Club and being part of this community and the annual events and all the fun things that our tribe pulls together and brings together. And um, so it was interesting. Max um, went on, graduated from Bozeman High School in 2007, attended university in Westminster and Salt Lake City, and graduated in 2011. And I was like, well, great, Max, you finished up school. What would you like to go do? And um, so this is this is our, one of our Christmas card pictures. And, or what would you like for your graduation present? We weren't going to buy him a car. I was thinking like maybe a computer or something like that. And he's like, no, I want to go climb Denali with my buddies. And I'm like, oh, I mean, did I hear you right? And he goes, yeah, let's go climb Denali. And so I thought, OK, this is great. So we, um, this is our Thanksgiving Day run that happens in Bozeman where we raise food money for the food bank. It's at Thanksgiving. It's always a frigid event, but we love running it together. And so we came back with uh, the boys. Claudia, this is one of your images here. Thank you. She's in the audience. Claudia, great image. Thank you. So this was uh, at the Bozeman Ice Festival a couple years back. She took a picture of the three boys, and um, it's one of my favorite ones there. But Max, he was like, well, I want to climb Denali. And growing up, it was... There were certain things that we had in our family. It wasn't like you're going to become a, a climber because you're born into it and you need to be in it. It was you're going to learn a second language, you're going to play an instrument, and you're going to go to university. Just three things. That's all we ask of you. And hopefully by doing those things, they get a lot of good life lessons in them. But we didn't want to be like, OK, you're going to have to go climbing. This is what you want to go do, and this is where we're at with it. But uh, for Max, he was really intrigued. In 2011, I led an expedition up. Uh, Denali with uh, some North Face athletes to, uh, to mentor them, and, and he, he saw that. He's like, oh, I want to go do that. So in 2013, we came back, and he was like, let's go to Denali. And so it was kind of fun because it was myself and uh, three other old guys and gals um, that were, and then we had uh, nine kids with us, all age 20 or 25 or something like that. So it was kind of a, a neat expedition flying into the range and um, Oh, got that backwards. We packed up all of our food here. This was uh, food for 13 people for a month. And 
I was like, well, this is kind of what we want. And so the, the kids went to Costco and they came back and I was like, whoa, that's way too much food. But I guess I have a, a reputation for not bringing enough food. So I said, well, let's just take all the food up there. So we did it. Uh, Phil Henderson on the left here is uh, a good friend of mine. Um, he's a uh, Knowles instructor. He's one of the senior guys there. He's working in Chile right now. And Ryan Hudson, the young guy from uh, San Diego that got into skateboarding, got really good at snowboarding, and rides uh, for snowboard, uh, Snowbird Ski Resort, resort and a uh, really great guy. And so it's like, Phil and I were tight. We were together on Everest in 2012. He didn't make it up. And he wanted to climb Denali. He turned back on it. So we were like, let's go do it. And he, um, we had this great opportunity with Ryan, who was Max's buddy from Salt Lake, to come along with us and to, um, to be part of this trip. And kind of mentoring this, this group of these young guys, we, um, you know, coming up to the, the, the Climbers Memorial in Talkeetna, it was, it was a pretty, uh, it's pretty sombering for these, they, well, when you're in your 20s, you're invincible. Nothing ever happens to me. If something happens, it happens to someone else. They're, they were less experienced. Something like that was bound to happen to them. You kind of push it off and you don't see it as yourself. But it's a, um, going in there, being able to point out some of the, um, the climbers that had been there previously and, and what they had climbed and how they had done it was, um, it was a pretty spectacular thing. But on a, on a personal level, flying into the range, I'd climbed an ollie oh, four times or something like that and previously and done a couple stints with the rangers. And, but to fly in with Max and his buddies was a real treat because here, here we were, we're going to uh, come back in, land at base camp. This is uh, an aerial view. Um, and to, for me, coming back to memory lane, the last time I was there was in 1989, so 24 years ago, and seeing how things had changed at the base camp and um, where it was. And um, so this is our team, all 13 of us, um, mostly a bunch of young kids, all bundled up underneath uh, Mount Hunter there in the background um, at the start of the expedition before we got things going. Some great, um, I want to introduce all the the kids in there because you're probably not going to remember them. But on my right here, this is uh, Jeremy Jones, who's like the legendary snowboarder of all time. I'm sure if I called him the Justin Bieber of snowboarder, he'd like totally beat me up. But he's more like the senior guy. But he'd never been up to Nolly, and he and I were collaborating together on the uh, Protect Our Winners. Like, hey, let's go, let's go up to Nolly. And so he's like, yeah, sure, we'll uh, jump with it. So. He was sort of my other partner, and then uh, John Krakauer and Phil Henderson. So the four of us and Kasha Rigby, we were, and she's, uh, she's not in her 20s, but she was the other mentor for our lady gals that were with us. So we all started up marching up, our, marching up onto uh, the peak, and it was great for, for Max and all of his buddies to, to see this mountain for the first time and, and see something new. And for them, it was... Uh, the scale of Denali, which is 14,000 feet from where you land to the summit, was um, something they really hadn't they really hadn't seen. They're used to 3,000 foot elevation gains, things like that. But um, we went up and enjoyed ourselves. This is uh, from the 17 camp to Denali Pass, the Autobahn. Um, you can see the what's happening there. Some of the challenges that uh, the big mountains and on the popular routes are facing on there that we have there. So a little shot of Max and I. Yes, he's four inches taller than I am. <laughs> he's stronger. He'll surpass me in every way, but that's what you want. So um, we went out climbing, doing all these good things. Um, kind of our the fun thing to do. I guess um, when you're up there on your own private trip, you can do things like climb without a rope and go skiing. The rangers, you guys are tethered in. We don't want to get in trouble. But um, a couple of cool things that we did, there was um, the, um, I think these guys are the rangers from uh, Fairbanks. They were up there on patrol. And um, I think the guy on the left is, is re-enlisting. And the guy on the right is reading his oath. And so they had me hold the flag and it was a pretty special thing because he was like I'm gonna re-enlist I'm gonna do it here and, and all his buddies were like okay this is it man he's not drunk he's there and it, it, it's good and they got over there and we videoed it and all that other stuff so there was a lot of uh, good things on there but it wasn't without its incident one day uh, John and I were out acclimatizing and we had a call of nature and 
we didn't have our disposable wag bags. We put them in there, and we were sighted for um, taking a dump, when we should have put it in a uh, crevasse. And John Krakauer, um, it, he has a lot of enemies in Alaska, as I found out, <laughs> because of his Into the Wild book. And either people like him or didn't. So when they found out that it was John, it just went nuts in the press. So we felt really bad. It was a humbling thing. And it was a, a learning experience that um, we won't uh, let happen again. But anyways. We went skiing. I'm being transparent about it. You can ask me about it on a, uh, at a different point. But um, so this snowboarding, uh, dropping into the uh, rescue gully here, and uh, it was, uh, these guys were pretty motivated. They, they, um, I was more cautious, but they were like getting after it. So I kind of upped my level of skiing and was able to fulfill one of my goals, which was to ski Denali. So. Um, but when we were there, this was uh, 2013, so it was the um, 100th anniversary of the ascent of uh, Denali. So in and around that day, we got everyone at 14 camp to come in there. And so this is the highest village in the United States, or perhaps North America at that time. We're all in there. And um, climbing with us at the same time was Expedition Denali, which was uh, a team of African-American climbers uh, put together by Knowles um, to go and uh, to have an, an all African American ascent of the mountain. So it, um, there's more diversity in that picture than you normally find on Denali. But um, it, uh, this is a good time. We had a, um, a great group of people there, everyone um, to come out for this, this one massive picture. Everyone in sunglasses and their noses covered and things like that. So the youngsters figured out tent life. Um, getting packed into a tent like sardines, playing hearts, things like that. They're uh, enjoying what it's like being in there. And um, on Father's Day, we had hoped to uh, have everyone acclimatized to a certain point, but um, we weren't quite there. And our goal was to go from 14 to the summit, to have that 6,000-foot day. So I purposely wanted to push the youngsters and say, OK, this is a 6,000-foot day. Is you guys should be able to handle that. And this is how we're going to do it. And so they were like, OK, we'll do it. And so they stepped up to it. And we, um, as a foray run, I was, Jeremy and I were acclimatized. He acclimatized well. It was his first time up there. He had to get back out quickly. So we uh, raced up the mountain, had a good time. Got a picture of that coming up here. I apologize. Usually when I have a presenting, I can see the upcoming slide, and I don't get myself backwards on here. But this is um, Windy Corner. This is uh, when you have a, a noun, which is a turtle. You turn it into a verb. You're turtling, and your sled is upside down, and you're dragging it. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, I don't know. I think something like this is always like, this is what brings on Tourette's syndrome. I've seen it happen there all the time. <laughs> the next thing you know, they're taking their ski stick, and they're beating the, uh, the sled down there. So. But uh, our goal was to haul all of our stuff up to 14 camp and pitch a, a, a floorless tent as our, as our dining room and then kind of go from there on, on our climbing trips and kind of figure out how, how we would go do it. So on the acclimatization run um, with Jeremy and I, it was, um, it was pretty cool. We went up, ended up, um, we were up there, and there were these two guys kind of climbing ahead of us. We didn't know who they were. And we came up, and we eventually caught up to them. And, there are these tough as nails Alaska guys, and I'm sure that uh, Mike and all the other rangers here know the type that they'll work like four shifts up in Fairbanks, and then they'll come down. And they're like, weather says it's clear for 72 hours, and they they just fly in, they gun it for Denali, and they. <laughs> so these guys were up there, and they were like, right around 19, and they were kind of feeling the effects of the weather or the altitude. So we were kind of in there, but. Um, here on the summit with uh, Robin and Jeremy, myself. I don't know what that thing on top of his head is, but it has something to do with age. So <laughs> I wear a floppy hat. He's got something else going on there. Interestingly, this uh, monument was placed on the mountain in, um, I think it was 1989, by uh, Vern Tejas and his team that were up there. And that was the, uh, and I might, when they went up there, I think they had a three meter long steel sort of device and they thread it all together and hammered it in there. So but it 
Whether that fills up or goes down, I have no idea, but um, it's sort of sticking out of the ground there, what uh, Denali is. So we tried going up to the summit. We kept uh, getting bouted by bad weather. And finally, we figured we had this window where we had good weather. And so we went up, and we got all the way up. Um, we were at the football field, and the team was up ahead. I was at the back of the group making sure everyone was getting up there. And then we're, there was people that left earlier. They were coming off the summit, and they were saying, get out of here, get out of here. And all of a sudden, just from the south side, billowing over us, this huge, massive storm came with a lightning. And so all of our ears are buzzing, things are popping, and it's absolutely um, horrendously crazy. So this is the RMI team that was with us. Um, we, had, we took all of our skis away because we had skis, and we separated all of our gear, and we sat there and waited for it to pass, and then went back down the mountain, which was... Um, a pretty challenging thing, doing it in zero, zero conditions and kind of a whiteout and everything like that. So it was, um, I think, a good learning experience for these, the youngsters. They all came back from it a little bit stronger, a little more happy. So here's all 13 of our whippets. So this is like the modern ice axe. I think it works a lot better than those wooden ones. But um, that was kind of the, for a, a run like, the ski run like Denali is kind of a, a transition, so we would uh, kind of go in with that. But this photograph, um, I put this in here as reference, and this is uh, the northwest face of Mount Hunter. And in um, 1989, this was the route that we had, we did a new route going up. Here's my mouse. Oh, it's not read, it's not, re it's not reading it. So the route goes up this section there, and. Um, it was pretty much, when we got there 23 years later, it was completely melted out. And when we climbed that route, we did it on the 4th of July. So we were there about a week earlier, and it was just, it was just looked, um, the whole mountain range just looked uh, anemic, like it didn't have any ice and snow on it. So hopefully this big winter that we had will um, give us a chance to, uh, to get more, to have that resurface and come back up there. So... Um, this is uh, probably the best part of it, is the uh, ranger camp at 17. This is Rennie Jackson, who's um, an alumni of uh, the National Park Service and ran the Grand Teton Rescue Service up there, and his daughter, and Ong, who's in the audience with us today. So um, we're now going on, um, it'll be our eighth year of Sherpa Exchange is to Denali Rescue Program. So as we talk about the challenges with Everest going forward, this is a great model of what Denali does. How are the the crowds, how many people are given permits, how is it managed, how do things go on there? And it's a, it's a very different mountain. It's 2,000 meters lower. The season goes from April 15th to July 15th, and there's probably 1,500 people that registered to go do it. And so it's a fairly, they manage it well. Everest, on the other hand, you'll have maybe three to 400 climbers and another equal amount of people in support of those climbers. And then the weather window is only two weeks, and then within those two weeks, you have to find a few days, and so that puts a lot more pressure on the mountain and the resources there, so, and it's also about 2,700 meters taller, which makes it a, a real challenge on there, so, um, but uh, this is, uh, this is a great, this is a great picture here, um, it's a bittersweet too, there's um, one of the guys in there was with me uh, on the upper right with the Everest cap. Lakba, he was with us in our 99 expedition and had um, is, you know, perished on uh, Annapurna working for a Western group. And so he was um, one of our students and instructors at the Kumbu Climbing Center and uh, had worked on Everest. And it, again, a lot of the challenges that we saw that happened in this um, on April 18th, these gentlemen here take the, um, a lot of the pressure is upon them. So. The Force Aid Mafia there. So, but anyways, it's all about friendship going up there. And here's John, <laughs> the elusive Mr. Krakauer. He does like to climb. He gets out there. And a um, special shout out to uh, Jeff. He's not here. Camilla, this is your excellent poster, uh, picture, pardon me. But um, Jeff's with us in spirit. And so he's uh, a fun guy up with the, um, the club here. One last thing. Today, 45 years, it was the 
United States chance to do a, a first ascent of some great magnitude. In the fact that the moon came <laughs> 16 years after the first ascent of Everest is pretty remarkable. I mean, climbing mountains is, is logical. And I mean, they went to the moon on a, on a rocket, didn't have, I mean, there's more computing power in your cell phone, <laughs> landed it with a ballpoint pen. It's pretty cool stuff. And I remember as a kid, I was just absolutely inspired by it. So it's one of those, it's right up there with May 29th, which was 53, the first ascent of Everest, July 20th, 69, one of those great points in um, history. So, Ken, you did a great job wrapping it up. I mean, this is my wrap up. We can either ask questions or you can, um, I can pass it over to Ellen. Okay, Ellen. <laughs> okay. Questions for Conrad. I have one. You had said something when we were first communicating about this paragraph about your first climb on Denali. And you were actually doing the science work? Yep. <clears throat> we were there in 1989, and I was uh, working for Arizona State University. And um, Muggs' brother, Ed Stump, is a uh, geologist from uh, Arizona State University in Tempe. And so we were studying the uplift of Denali, and the technique that is used there is uh, fission tracking. So we went and sampled granite from the summit all the way down to um, 3,000 feet at 100 meter intervals, 300 foot intervals, and we'd take a sample out. And then within that granite, apatite is one of the elements that's in there, and that would just get taken out. And then the track that apatite leaves is as it's exposed to the atmosphere allows us to gauge the uplift of the mountain. So Denali is still growing. It's at the crest of the, the, the Asia Pacific ring of fire going north. So it, um, it's growing in geologic time. It's not going to probably grow much in our time. But it was a great expedition. And we, um, I was able to go up there. And I was Muggs' subby dude, which at the time I was probably 24 or 25. So <laughs> and he'd played football, and his knees were bad. So he made me carry the rocks. <laughs> He's like, you'll be stronger for it. I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> no. Other questions? Oh, come on. You spent the whole of the oil farming. <laughs> well, is Max going to continue climbing? Well, um, <laughs> he's not crazy about it. I mean, it, 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 it's just not crazy. He likes to do it. He'd like to go back to Denali because we were, I mean, he was within right there, but it was. When we turned back, it was the most primal messaging to turn back. It was like just the most reptilian part of our brain that said, go home. There wasn't any like, well, if we go up now, how much food do we have? How much water? There was just like, we're out of here. And so maybe if he comes back, he'd like to come climb that and do that. But um, as of yesterday, he didn't come like, let's go out for the Dawn Patrol cragging mission. So he's not like a lifer, which is probably good. It makes Jenny's life easier. <laughs> you don't want to be a lifer. <laughs> you know, life is just like all, you know, do other I'm things. What's the difference between climbing with your son compared to another expedition? The difference between climbing with my son and another expedition, um, I can bark at my son with more authority. He might push back a little, but um, it's, I don't guide, so I'm not, I just stopped doing that in 93 at my mother's request, and so it's just not my cup of tea. And, um, but Max was great. It was with his buddies in there, and um, I think they all, they all knew I'm a drill sergeant, and I expect a lot of them. And they would like, the, the, the wake up, I'd be like, who left the food bag unzipped last night? It snowed three inches. And they'd be like all in their tent. And they'd like, ended up it wasn't one of the kids. <laughs> and I found that like, like the second day in, the, the responsible party came over and said, I left the bag undone. Don't be barking at the kids. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but you got the lesson, right? Because <laughs> you unzip your food bag and it'll snow overnight. And I mean, everyone's kind of experienced that. So. But it's a good time with them. And um, I think we're better friends for it. You know, to do something like that where you're living side by side for 21 days and doing something that's challenging is um, it's a good, it's 
good thing to do. It's a good thing to do with, with your family. So I appreciate that. Uh, and I, how do you get caught misplacing your weight? How do, we, with a telescope. We were skiing up, and we just all of a sudden we had a crowning moment of glory. And so, and we came down, we're like, oh man, we're so, we apologized, and, but we didn't have the plastic bag, and we were skiing, we didn't know that, it was like, oh my gosh, so, and that was that, and then some reporter that has an axe to grind with Krakauer caught it, and then it was, and then the Daily Mail picked it up in England, so it was pretty humbling, so that was that. <laughs> Anyways, this guy, the reporter or something that, it was like, oh my gosh, He'd already had a big beef about the whole Fairbank story with Into the Wild and whatnot. So that was, um, that was a good learning experience. So. He was getting that live stream on his iPad.